Hey guys, I'm Jeff from Sketchbook Comics uh, in St. Catharines, and this is clearly John Lehman. Hello. Writer, editor, former editor, I guess. Yep. Well, you probably edit yourself, so current editor. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, letterer, designer, there you go. Uh, assistant editor. Uh, yeah, I've done everything in comics except maybe draw and color. Nice. Inking too? No, no. Oh, oh no, it, that, <laughs> I consider that drawing. Oh, yeah, fair no. enough, fair enough. So there's, you can see there's not a ton of us, so we'll keep it informal. You know, if anybody's got a question, throw your hand up and ask it. All good. Um, I, I actually know a fair amount about you from Rob a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. But um, uh, yeah, be curious to see what his perspective is versus mine. <laughs> um, I mean, he spent a lot of time actually talking about um, like other media forms. Okay. I mean, at the time, he, he talked a, a lot about things where. Hollywood had kind of come in and, and, and gone back out, yeah, know, similar yeah. to the tide. I guess if, if I'm remembering correctly, like two or three times. And uh, he said at the time we're it up was to five times. I was going to say at the time he said the tide was back in, and, yeah. and we'd see yeah. what happened. Yeah, but it's it's out again. Uh, fair enough. You know, it took preacher 15 years to get out. So this is true. Yeah, I figure I need more money in 15 years than <laughs> I do right now. So I'm I'm patient, but but like the first time we were so excited, we thought we thought we were getting a TV show and. Uh, it just fell through, and ever since then, it, you know, something happens, and then it falls through, and I've just stopped paying attention. Right, know? right. At least I'm now to the point where it's getting checks. You know, every couple of years, I get an option check. And there was times at the beginning where Rob and I were so stupid, we just got kind of hustled by someone with, with a lot of uh, flattery, and there, right. were, there were no checks involved. So now at least we get, you know, paid a little. Nice. Which shows them, shows you they're at least halfway serious that they're ponying up money. Right, um, right. You know, there was a, a Chew cartoon series that was supposed to happen, and we uh, we recorded with Stephen Yoon and Felicia Day and David Tennant, yeah. and then nothing ever happened. And in retrospect, nothing ever was going to happen. Uh, he In Hollywood, it takes deals to get deals. Right. So he paid these guys a minimum and then promised them a percentage on the back end and then just used it to say, I've got Chew in production and try to get other other deals, but but after David Tennant um, uh, recorded, nothing ever happened, and uh, and it was just a lot of promises until we finally disengaged ourselves. Right. But I mean, that that was three years of wasting our time, which yeah, I, I understand they, is very common. In yeah, Hollywood. I was going to say, my guess is that's probably fairly normal for Hollywood. Uh, yeah, he mentioned. I think the last thing he mentions is that that John Chu, no Tony Chu. No, 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 I'm um, the actor, sorry. Oh, John Cho? Cho, Cho. Um, was still interested in playing him, and, and there was still a possibility there, but again, it's been, yeah. I think, two years at this point, so yeah, it's, he's probably moved on. Yeah, there's been a, a, a few, you know, we liked, we liked Stephen, uh, oh, God, the guy from Lost, All right, uh, Ken Leung, was yes, our yes. first uh, person. It, it's been uh, uh, John Cho um, and... Uh, uh, and then Stephen Yoon from Walking Dead. That's who he had mentioned. Yeah. Yes, sorry, yeah. Stephen Yoon. That's the one. And the the person I currently like for Tony, uh, and it's cool because you get to meet these people. Right. You know, you like you find them on the internet. You find out they're a fan. Is a it's a comedian named Steve Byrne, and he looks like Tony, uh, and uh, he's just a filthy comedian, <laughs> and uh, he's uh, cosplayed as Tony. Like I discovered him. He cosplayed Tony for like, or not cosplay. It was his his Halloween costume. Oh, nice! And it's like, wow, who is this comedian? And I started following him. And now, when he comes to Phoenix, I visit. You know, I'll, I'll go to the show and you know give him comics, and he you know gets me in the show. So That's it's neat awesome. to sort of like meet celebrities who like your comic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember one time, um, I went to a show and I made friends with uh, Rigby from the regular show, and uh, and he's like, uh, and this was when we had a cartoon we thought we were going to have going. He's like, you know who's a voice actor on uh, on regular show and he'd be really good as Savoy? Mark Hamill. And I'm like, you know, could, did not only Luke Skywalker, but the, the Joker. The Joker, yeah. And so I gave him comic books to give to Luke Skywalker. And then there's some point where, um, of course it fell through, but um, he read the comics and he, he tweeted. And it's like, I've got a, a saved tweet from Mark Hamill talking about how much he loved Chew, which is... That's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, huge nerd thing for me.
All right. Have you got no question? Oh, back there, sure. Uh, I met you uh, at your booth. Uh-huh. Uh, and I asked, how did you conceive of Juno? Uh, and you said, well, I just wanted to see what you were a weird guy. Would you mind elaborating? Yeah, well, it, it's... Uh, Okay, the longer version is I had a bunch of different ideas, like like a, you know almost like an idea notebook, and I had like the the guy who could eat things and you know get the psychic impressions, and and then I had the the chicken flu. You know what if people are you know selling eggs and you know if they outlaw chicken, then you've got like egg drug dealers and chicken wing you know you know dealers, and I had the woman who um, uh, you know could 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 write and you could taste you know you could taste what she was writing and they all seemed like really kind of like saturday night live sketches like really one stupid idea that just you know is going to get old really fast but then i realized wait i've got like i've got like five different food ideas and they don't have to be separate if i combine them suddenly i've got this like rich and limitless tapestry so i decided to make a you know food comic and then suddenly like uh, it, it just became so vast. So that that's the longer. There, there was no, like, moment where I got the idea for, for Tony's power. I just had all these, like, little ideas and then connected them together. What about the scientific names? You make it look so easy. Oh, so I was an English major in school, and um, one of my favorite classes was, was etymology, where you, like, learn the history of words. Oh, okay. And uh, and. I don't research, you know, Chu doesn't require any realism, you know, it's all, you know, silly, I don't have to, but the one thing I would research is root words, and I'd go into like, you know, Greek, you know, like a Greek dictionary or Latin dictionary, and I would, you know, pick and choose what would sound the best, and I swear to God, some of these would take like an hour or two to find, like that was the one point where I slow down in my tracks to find these weird words, and there was a point where um, David Tennant was in the studio recording for Savoy, and I never wrote this expecting things to be read out loud. Right. And he's like, how do you pronounce this? I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I just read it. Uh, so I just had to make it up. But yeah, that was um, that was always a really fun part. And now that I'm writing Outer Darkness, uh, the, the, the sci-fi horror book, my favorite part is like researching like old, weird, like gods and demons and like all every star system, every ship, you know, is named after some kind of you know, weird mythological, you know, demonic figure or god or, you know, something like that. So that's my one little piece of research I do in each uh, book. Yeah, I like the idea of, like, basically, like you said, a bunch of Saturday Night Live sketches that you were like, if I cram these together, they have some legs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but if it was just one, and it was funny because when Chew first came out, there was a couple of reviewers who were like, oh, this is just going to be the body part of the week. You know, what happens when, you know, he's eaten every body part by issue eight and right. you, you get old? But I knew, you know, first of all, there was a big supporting cast, and I kind of knew, you know, it, it was going to be beyond just Tony. And I think, well, in in volume five, we, we take him out of commission, and, yeah. like, his sister yeah. shows up for an entire arc. And, like, when you can get rid of the lead character for, for six issues, that yeah. kind of shows you how strong the... The supporting cast is. Is there anybody who hasn't read it yet? Okay, I, I'm telling you now. I'm gonna spoil stuff. You okay with that? Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, like for me at the near the end of the series when she dies, and and everything that comes out of that, I was like, this is brilliant. Yeah. Well, when who? Everyone dies basically. When when, it, when the sister dies. Oh yeah. And she's already made all these plans. Yeah. And I was like. Holy crap. Well, this is amazing. Well, and I didn't want to, like, fridge her. You know, I wanted right. her to come out strong, and, you know, she ultimately gets the last laugh. But I spend an entire arc, you know, knowing what's going to happen, making her the most lovable person. Yep. And, and again, there, you know, we, we read reviews. And uh, this one reviewer is like, this, is, this arc has gotten really soft. It's all this, like, you know, cotton candy with this, like, you know, happy-go-lucky sister. And... Uh, and he's like, yeah, I'm getting really tired of it. It's like, well, wait until the next issue, dude. You don't know when. Uh, like, my wife doesn't care about comics. She's a she's a great proofreader. She's like super kind of methodical, and she will read. You know, she she just doesn't care, but she'll find every typo and every right. grammatical error. And uh, issue 30, 30 made her cry, and that's when I knew that you know that I got her because she she didn't give a damn about you, but uh, you know it, it had her bawling. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah. It, it, I, and I honestly, I love the whole scene where she's basically being killed, and, yeah. and 
she's like, yeah, screw you type yeah. of thing. Yeah, she goes out strong. She can see yeah. the future. So she knows she's going to die, and then she's made plans. And then uh, I, I, uh, I was very into The Shield. Uh, it's right. one of my all-time favorite shows, and, uh, and I like to study structure. And, and if you watch The Shield, everything leads up to, to stealing the Romanian money train, and then, and then everything is the fallout. Right. You know, of the, the the team breaking up and fighting over money and everything going to hell. And uh, for me, Chu was like that. I mean, the exact halfway point is where this terrible thing happens. Yeah. And everything else is kind of a you know the fallout from that. Yep. I mean, I know everybody loved uh, Poya, the, the chicken. <laughs> uh, like that thing blew up. Yeah. Uh, Poya was, was that meant? No, Poya <laughs> was like the one character who who was unexpected right. and. Uh, and I introduced him in a, you know, you have all these like, you know, chicken stories. So, yeah. you know, cockfighting, you know, yep. you got a, a fighting rooster <laughs> and you got this badass fighting rooster. And then, uh, so he's just kind of a MacGuffin at first. And then I, I brought him back and, you know, I, I'd established he's like this really badass rooster. And, uh, and there's a point where he kills this gangster and I have him, you know, attack and like pluck out his eye. And then Rob's drawing it. And I, I, I rarely second guess myself, but there's a point. It's like, oh my god, it would have been so much funnier if the chicken like ripped out his heart rather than you know ripped out his eye, and uh, but it was already drawn. And, right. I, and, and I even call Rob. I'm like, Rob, we got to change this scene. And he's like, Well, I drew it. And it's like, eh, all right, well, I got to bring back Poya. Yep. So <laughs> so we brought him back in issue 18, and then it just became a, ex, you know, accelerate. You know, the the joke has to get bigger right. and more outrageous and people loved Poyo. Hold, hold up Poyo, would you? Uh, you know, the most badass rooster in the world and then uh, Poyo gets killed and then the government rebuilds him as a bionic rooster and uh, and so he becomes this like badass bionic uh, secret agent rooster and then we kill him and even hell can't contain him so he comes back as demon chicken Poyo and people were so mad, you know, because People really died in Chew, yeah. but it's like, Poya's the one character, like, how could you kill him? It's like, well, he's a chicken, and he's coming back <laughs> as a demon, so, you know, don't get too mad about Poyo. I just would, you'd turn the page, and there'd be this two-page spread of Poyo doing something. Yeah, yeah, and those were a page, lot of fun. And it's done. <laughs> yeah, just little jump cuts, but yeah. everyone, and it was Wasn't fun. was one where him. he's in space? Yeah, I, yeah, I think he was fighting uh, Oyop, the anti-Poyo. That's right, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun with those. Yeah, as I read, I was like, I wonder if this was planned. No, no, Poya was the one thing that. Uh, so, I I planned out a lot, and um, he always I always knew where an arc was heading, and and you know so I'd set it up, and then you know no you know because I, I had kind of had a skeleton for the whole series. Right. So issues one and two of every arc were, were kind of the setup, and issue four and five was you know where you get to the resolution. But if you look at Chu. The third issue of every arc is where I didn't know what I was doing. So those are like the craziest, like most insane, because I was just like, this is the freedom issue. So right. anything with, that ends on a three or an eight <laughs> tends to be really, you know, just weird and out there. Nice. Yeah, go ahead. Speaking of planning, um, I know sometimes there's a lot of planning. When did you figure out, okay, this is what I want to do? Well, I knew how it was going to end, but. Um, just going back to the history of Chew, I had been pitching it a long time. I like I thought it would be a Vertigo book, and I you know Vertigo pays a raid. I needed money. Uh, um, every time a new editor came on, or every like six months, I'd you know, hey, here's my you know my Cannibal Bird Flu book, and uh, everyone thought it was stupid. And I had friends, you know, I've been in comics since '95, and uh, you know I'd, I'd see somebody from IDW or you know just just an editor friend, and they're like. Still pitching that stupid cannibal book. <laughs> I'm like, damn it, I'm going to do that cannibal book someday. And uh, uh, I had some, I had a, a couple years of bad luck, like just comics, a bad experience or it didn't sell or something went wrong. Uh, we had a kid. Uh, my wife was in newspapers, which seemed to be dying at the time. And, uh, and suddenly uh, I get a call from a friend who says, uh, uh, I work for Nintendo. Activision wants me to write this game. I can't. It's a conflict of interest. But I've thrown them your name. And then Activision is like, ooh, comics are cool. You know, you want to write this video game? And it's like, yeah, sure. I need I need work. Yeah. And uh, I write this video game, and then another producer liked it. Another, and suddenly I'm getting 
like video games are falling out of the sky, paying me 30000 a pop, and I can't get work, you know, writing for Dynamite at, you know, $45 a page. And I'm getting all this video game work, not getting any comic work, and uh, still want to be in comics. Uh, no one's buying my stupid bird flu cannibal book. And suddenly I get a call uh, for the Marvel MMO. And it's going to be written by Brian Bendis. But, you know, Brian Bendis is Brian Bendis. And uh, they need somebody to work with him but to be in-house. You know, Brian's not going to take an office job. And and it, great pay. And uh, so... Uh, we left Seattle. My wife quit her job. You know, she was going to attend the baby. And I moved to San Jose to work on the Marvel MMO. And, uh, you know, great gig. And this was going to be get in the door with Marvel because I'd be working with Brian Bendis every day. And, uh, and good pay. And he did it for about three months. And then Microsoft pulled the plug on the game. And I was stuck in this strange town without the job I came for. And it became like generic superhero game. It, it ultimately shipped as Champions Online. But I, I stayed on as the lead writer, and suddenly I've got more money than I've ever had because I'd been working in comics. And it's like, well, and they told you, they told me as soon as the game ships, you know, video games, we we let go, you know, half the team. So I'm going to finance my stupid cannibal bird flu book that nobody wants, and it's not going to sell, uh, but I'll be able to show it to editors and be like. Oh, not chew ideas, but like there were plenty of superhero, you know, ideas. Uh, um, and so I set out. I had a I had a budget, maybe maybe twelve or fifteen k, and I was gonna pay an artist to draw. And you know, I would lose money, but in the long run, it would help me get work when suddenly I'm I'm out of a video game job and and working in in wanting to be in comics again. Right. So it took me like nine months of calling friends and saying, hey, I've got money. I want to hire somebody. Oh, you know, check out, you know, George. Check out, you know, Fred. And uh, and I finally got told to check out uh, uh, Rob. Right. And uh, and Rob was doing a manga book for Tokyo Pop at the time. And Tokyo just Pop just went under. And I'm like, uh, I don't want a manga artist. You know, I want, I want a, I've always tried to write the books that I want to read. So I wanted kind of a fun artist, someone kind of cartoony to offset the really grossness of Jew. And so I like, you know, we, I met this guy, Rob, uh, at San Diego Con in, in the bar after hours, which is where all the business yeah. gets conducted. Yeah. And uh, told him about it and, uh, you know, said, you know, uh, oh, I, I got to back up. I had called Image at one point because I knew Eric Stevenson for years. There's a, a bar we go to in Seattle at Seattle Con and, and drink there together. So we're friendly enough, and this is pre Walking Dead, so Image is Image wasn't giant. Yeah. And I call up Eric Stevenson. And I said I lo I'm looking for an artist. I have a budget. It's a paying gig. Uh, you know, it's my it's a, my Cannibal Bird flu book, and he had never heard about it. Uh, and he's like, Well, I don't know any artists. You know, you have to find your own artist. But if you find the right art, if you find a good artist, we will publish it. So suddenly I had a publisher. Yeah. And so I tell Rob Guillory, you can do some sample pages, but if Eric doesn't like you, sorry, dude, I got to find somebody he does like. So I, you know, I wasn't necessarily the bad guy. Yeah. So I had told him, you know, the history, everything I, I've told you guys. Um, I had also told him that I that I pitched it a few times to Vertigo. So he drew it in a very like scratchy kind of like. Like um, just a Vertigo style, like like kind of kind of ugly and yep. not cartoony and all this, and 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 I get the page and I'm like, oh yeah, dude, this isn't gonna work out. You know, you're you're not the dude. And he's like, well, why not? And it's like it's because it's like I didn't didn't want this like Guy Davis style. You know, nothing right. against Guy yeah. Davis, but he was trying to ape him. And it's like, what's this cartoony stuff on your website? That's what I like. He's like, well, that's my style. But no one ever tells me to draw in my style. Everyone says, draw like Mignola, draw like, you know, Guy Davis, you know, right. and I was trying to draw like a Vertigo artist. And I'm like, no, do the pages again, but draw like yourself. And, and it worked out. And uh, you never know what you're going to get with an artist. So I'm, I'm answering your question. It's just taking a half an hour. Um, <laughs> I thought I would do five issues with Rob 
and then maybe I'd make money eventually, you know, maybe it would sell through and I'd make enough of a profit that in another year I'd do another five issue miniseries. And eventually over like 10 or 12 years, I would tell the entire story in like 25 issues. You know, I knew the ending. I figured it would be different artists, you know, and, and, and spread out more. And then Chew hit and it hit big yeah. out of the gate. And I wasn't used to having like a real hit and they, they, it, it sold out. Uh, and then it, we reprinted it, and then we reprinted it, and Image says, we think we can reprint it one more time. Let's call it a last bite edition, you know, fourth printing. And so we do the, the fourth printing last bite edition. It sells out in a day. There's so much heat. And we're like, but we just said it was the last edition. We can't reprint it, and there's still a demand. And so Kirkman steps in and says, do it as a – he'd already done a five-page preview in Walking Dead 61. He said, let's just print the entire issue in black and white. And you can, you know, you can pay the printing, you know, it'll be a couple hundred dollars, you know, for printing. Um, uh, but, you know, it'll, it'll be good exposure. Yeah. So we printed it in the back of, you know, 60,000 Walking Deads. And then suddenly, or, or we're about to, and then the, the couple hundred dollars that Kirkman said it was turned out to be several thousand dollars. And I had already you know, sunk thousands of dollars into yeah. paying Rob. And I'm scared, you know, I haven't, see, I'm putting in money and I haven't seen any. And I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't do this. You know, I'm going to go broke. And Kirkman says, trust me, you know, you, you do this, it, it's, it's going to reach tens of thousands of people. And, and, you know, he basically talked me into it and I, I kind of felt like I owed him. Uh, and uh, so I said, yes. And, and it shot our circulation up thousands. Yeah. But at that point, our numbers were so high. It's like, well, I can tell the whole story. Like I can, I can do this whole thing as one ongoing. You know, assuming this Rob guy, you know, can can you know keep up. And and he was very hungry. Rob's a total professional. Um, so, um, as a, like an editor and someone who like uh, 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 studies structure, you know, I looked at all my favorite books: Why the Last Man, Transmet, uh, Scalped, uh, Preacher. They're all around 60 issues and then I look at Sandman which I like but it's kind of self-indulgent and all over the place yeah. and I thought um, you know 60 issues is a novel you know 60 issues is a good novel where you, you can go and it, you know they, you can cut it into 15 uh, issue quarters and 30 issue halves like yeah. it like structurally it was really good uh, it, it'll be a good length of a novel so I said right out of the gate, as soon as I knew we had the numbers, if we could do anything, let's go 60 issues. And we ended up 64 when you count like the Pollo specials and the revival. But basically, uh, we did a, a re revival crossover. Basically, we did 60 issues. And uh, we were getting close to the end. And Kirkman's like, why are you killing the cash cow, man? You could go 100 issues. You know, look at Walking Dead. Uh, but... But I always write with an ending in mind. Right. And by then, I, I couldn't stretch it, and I didn't want to. You know, things, yep. good things have to end. And all my, my favorite TV shows, you know, The Shield, The Sopranos, you know, Breaking Bad, you know, they all have have endings, and they're, they're stronger yep. for it. Um, so, yeah, we said we were going to go 60. We went 60, and now suddenly I'm, like, back to the hustle. You know, now I'm, you know, Chew did so well I didn't have to sell it you know I could just sit there and loads of people we had giant lines in San Diego uh, and you know now I have to I, I have to work for it again sell it kind of sucks yeah. if the fans demand it, would you write a I, I'm actually working on more stuff in the Chew universe like like I think Rob had ideas of like oh let's do untold tales of, of Tony Chew you know let's do some flashback stories and I'm I, I don't want to do anything that doesn't break new ground. I don't want to just do something to, to do it. But uh, enough time has passed that I miss the universe. So um, I've written 100 pages of new Chew stuff. Uh, it's just um, uh, Rob's doing farmhand, so he's not available. And, and we're trying to find a way where he can participate and still feel like a part of it. But we also have to move forward and then like farmhand is doing so well that you know rob doesn't rob it's like baby bird has left the nest you know he can he, he can you know survive on his own without me so why shouldn't he create his own stuff uh but yeah there is more chew in in the future and i would even say uh there's 
Chew coming in 2020. Nice. Yeah, go ahead, man. A lot of uh, the kind of stories that you've cited in the 60 issue vein, a lot of those creators have said that uh, that just takes so much out of you. Often oh, you yeah. We have like one of those uh, in them. Do you have uh, others that are as Well, the, the book that I'm working on now, The Outer Darkness, which is kind of scary Star Trek, it was initially conceived as 30 issues instead of 60 because I thought it was nice. Um, it would be nice to just do half the length of Chew, and it's since grown to around 36. Um, but yeah, I could never do another 60 issue thing. It was a, uh, it, it, I, uh, I took a long break afterwards. I took almost a year off because it just, uh, it took so much out of me. Um, and Rob, meanwhile, and, and that's kind of why, why Farmhand happened because Rob has three kids. You know, his, uh, uh, his wife doesn't work full time, and, and he's younger and he's hungrier. And you know, Rob just Rob's happier, happiest when he's working. So he's like, "Oh, when are we gonna do more? When are we gonna do more?" And it's like, Rob, I'm going to Israel. I'm going to South Africa. You know, I'm going to India. Like I, I went on all these adventures and just kind of was lazy because I'm old and lazy. And Rob is young and hungry. So he, by the time I'm like, "Hey, Rob, let's do something," he's like, "Well, I'm doing farmhand." So. I'm not sure what your question was. Oh, oh, uh, 60 issues, yeah. I don't ever want to do 60 issues again. And and if I did new, when I do new choose st stuff, it's going to be the Hellboy model, where we do an arc, and then we take a break, and then do another arc. So I don't I don't want to be on the, the treadmill of, you know, endless deadlines, because, you know, by the time we got to 60, man, I mean, look at Dave Sim. By issue 300, he was insane. And I mean, don't get me wrong, Kirkman is doing fine, mm -hmm. but as a shop owner, I can tell you a lot of my Walking Dead readers lately have kind of dropped off. Well, probably, especially after this last month, I'm not sure. The last the issue, I, yeah. I mean, because that could be, that could be the ultimate uh, a drop off point. Like, yeah. it's a really interesting it's a, thing it's a that he just did. Interesting move, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I I just I don't want to do a book forever, and yeah. uh, I have limited a, a interest in superheroes because they never end. Because you can, once you look behind the curtain, you know, it's just a, a revolving door of who dies, and you know, oh, I'm mourning, you know, whoever died this month. Well, yeah. they're going to be back in yeah. six months, and that's why I can I can never get mad about superhero stuff. You know, oh, you know, Thor's a woman. I'd give it six months, you know. Oh, you know, they killed so-and-so. They'll be back. I think Thor is a woman. People would complain to me about it and complain to me about it. I'd be like, but it's more interesting. Yeah, it's something different. You and know? they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, Jane Foster's Thor is far more interesting than Thor was. I'm like, and he is far more interesting as the unworthy Thor. I'm like, guys, you may think it was just so that, oh, you know, we, have, we can get more girls reading. I'm like, but maybe it was just a really good story idea. Yeah. Yeah, and you know the the good stories last, and if it's a bad story, well then they're going to reboot it anyways, right. and they're you know a, a, a couple of years from now a new writer is going to be trying something different. So I'm very, uh, I just can't be bothered by superhero stuff. I enjoy yeah. it, but but I, I can't get worked up. Yeah, about I mean it. another good one is is, is um, Heroes in Crisis. People lost their minds over all the Wally West stuff. And yeah, I, and my friend who did the last panel there on his podcast was asking me about it because I'm a huge Wally West fan. And he's like, what do you think? I'm like, this story means nothing if you tell it with Commander Steel. You know, you got to use a big name. Yeah. Wally will be back in some capacity. Like, yep. It's comics. <laughs> like, yeah. So you said you've got, I haven't, I haven't read Outer Darkness yet. Have you guys? No, I just read It's it. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't, I just honestly haven't had an opportunity. My, my reading habits tend to run hardcovers and soft oh, covers yeah. now. You know, I flip through things on the shelves unless it's something I, I really want. The Heroes in Crisis I was reading as it came out. Type well, the, the first trade just came out, and, yeah. and readers are different now. I mean, people do trade weight, which it kind of sucks because, yes. you know, numbers yes. aren't what they were, and yeah. you watch numbers and you, you kind of sweat, but there's digital, there's Amazon, yeah. there's, there's you know, different kind of trade waiters. There's the trade waiters for, for hardcovers, for soft covers, yeah. um, and people ask, you know, how do you want me to read the book? And you know, ultimately, you, you would love it if everyone bought floppies, but I yep. understand you can't. I'm just happy you read the book. You know, if you buy it digitally, if you buy it in hardcovers, you know, I just buy comics the way you want to buy comics. As a shop owner, I push the floppies like crazy so that we can get to the soft covers, yeah. And, yeah. you know, et cetera. 
Um, but it also means that I can wait for the soft covers and hard covers. But you know, nail biter was another one I did it with. Oh, a nail biter, biter was great. Yeah. yeah, Outer Darkness like uh, uh, came out of like like Chu got very kind of science fictiony at the end. Uh, and, and I was just gravitating towards science fiction, right. and I, I, I had done a, a Next Generation and Deep Space Nine rewatch, and I really like Star Trek. So I wanted to write, I also like Event Horizon, though it's not, a, it's a, there's a good movie in there, but it's, it's, and, it's and, not necessarily the one you're seeing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just the idea of sci-fi horror really appealed to me and kind of playing with like, you know, sci-fi tropes. So right. Outer Darkness is, you know, a, a crew going into the farthest part of space, they all hate each other, and space is very scary. Um, basically, we discovered that when you die, there's no heaven, there's no hell. Your soul just goes out. And when it's out in space forever, it gets angry, it gets lonely. And uh, so they've got the technology. <coughs> if, if you die, they can bring back your soul. But it's got to be, you got to be somebody important, you know. So people join this military, and there's almost like a system where, you know, if, if I'm a a private and my soul's a light year away they'll they'll rescue you know they're not going to fly a million light years you know to rescue right. it but but if you're like a general or someone important to like the war effort so the more important you are the more they'll you know go after souls so it's right. uh but because there's there's corrupted souls of everything that's ever lived in the universe there's demons and old gods and you know ghosts and uh so space is like a it's, it's a very nihilistic um at least on the surface right but where Chu is a tragedy disguised as a comedy, yeah. this is actually a redemption story disguised as this very dark nihilistic thing, but it, it, it's ultimately going to be better than it, it sounds. Uh, it, it's not, because it, I'm getting a lot of pushback from reviewers. is like, none of the characters are likable. And it's like, well, it's a redemption story. You gotta start, you gotta start with them right. unlikable to, you know, to make yeah. it mean something. But, uh, you know, I can only work on one kind of long, one long form thing at a time. And then I take little side gigs, you know, like, uh, you know, five issues of Charlie's Angels just for, for fun. Yeah. Uh, or, or like Joe Eisman, I was always said, let's work together. And then uh, an editor comes and like, oh, you want to do Charlie's Angels with Joe Eisman? It's like, ooh, get paid writing something fun with a buddy, right. you know, what, and then you get a trade on your uh, bookshelf. So why wouldn't you want to do that? Uh, so I, t I tend to write, like, I like superheroes, but I am just as happy writing a Godzilla comic or a, or a Judge Dredd comic as a Batman. Like, one doesn't mean more to me than the other. Yeah. So, you know, I always try to write a couple licensed things just for fun, just, just to scratch, you know, a nerd itch. You know, I got, to, I got to do Predator a couple years ago. I got to do Judge Dredd, you know, Mars Attacks, Godzilla. These are all things I'm into. Right. Like, I'm, I'm at a point to... You had enough success uh, that that I'm not like super hungry for work, so I won't say yes to anything that I don't want to do. Right. And I say no to a lot. Hey, do you want to do like I love Star Trek? I have no interest in doing a Star Trek comic. You know, I'm kind of doing my own Star Trek comic. It, yeah, exactly. So it's like, hey, do you want to write a you know a, a Next Generation comic? Love to read them. Don't want to write them. Is there anything that you do want to write yeah. that you haven't had the opportunity yet? Uh, I, I always have a bucket list. Right. And I think the bucket list right now is Plastic Man, uh, Star Wars, They Live. They Live, um, I think, would be fantastic. Yeah. It blows my mind that it's never yeah. really been... Yeah. In fact, I would like to do They Live with McRae. I think he would do a, a fantastic <laughs> job. And yeah. I did uh, I did 10 issues of Mars Attacks with McRae. And we've been friends for... You know, I, he worked with me when I was an editor in, like, 97. Right. And, you know, we're, we're drinking buddies... And he's a phenomenal artist. So when I got offered Mars Attacks, which I loved anyways, they're like, do you want to do it with John McRae? And it's like, oh, my God. You know, yes, to, wor to work with um, with a friend whose art you, you know, love anyways, yeah. there's nothing better. But, yeah, the, uh, Star Wars, They Live, Plastic Man, uh, maybe Archie. You know, I, I've, I've liked Archie, but I keep knocking on their door, and they're not too interested. And it's like, yeah, all right, I tried. Which is interesting because they've gone in different directions yeah. over the last yeah. few years. And, you know. Well, so I pitched, and I still love this idea. Uh, they did Afterlife with Archie, yep. and you know, it was kind of like Archie meets The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. I pitched Apocalypse with Archie, which was basically, you know, the nuke drops, and they right. all go into the bunker, and it comes out, and it's, it's basically Archie as Mad Max, which I think would be a that, blast. I but think I that would be fantastic. Yeah, I can't can't sell them on it and I've stopped trying uh, 
you know, they, they're like, well, do you want to write this instead? I'm like, eh, no, not really. Come to me when you like my idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's... It, and and the horse stuff's done so well for them. You well, wouldn't think that something like that would be. Yeah, but yeah, you know they. Sense. You also have to think about media, and they've got Sabrina, and they like. Yeah, they, you know, they yeah. probably want to tie it in with the TV series. Like you can't understand what goes on in a public. say that's mind. fair, but we're also getting Archie versus Predator too. Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> other questions? Okay. Uh, Sorry. Uh, sure. Let's oh, go yeah, with him, sure. and then we'll come back to you. All right. Oh no no no! Like like, uh, well sometimes like uh uh, uh he's but, got a lot of them. Uh, you know, I you meet people at shows and and especially like these weird foreign shows where you just end up at dinner with Rigby from regular show. You know, I, I if I had an extra one, I give it to him. But a lot of times, I just get their address and mail them a, a care package. Uh, and you know, I mailed his name's Bill. Uh, I I mailed Bill two copies of every single thing and said. You know, give one to, you know, give one to Mark Hamill. And so worst case scenario, he throws him in the trash. Yeah. Best case scenario, Luke Skywalker reads my comic and sends out a tweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't carry them around everywhere, but at cons, I'm selling them anyways. So I usually have a few, you know, extra to, you know, give to, you know, to, to VIPs uh, or uh, people walking down the hall with us. Yeah. Well, th- those are the <laughs> floppies. But like, yeah. uh, you know, I was at, uh, I was at New Zealand con and ended up at a table with Helen Slater, you know, Supergirl. Nice. Yeah. And she started talking about my comic. It's like, well, I'm going to give Supergirl, a, you know, a, one of my comics. So don't know if she ever read it, but. Go ahead, man. Okay, uh, you talked about researching words to give scientific names uh-huh. to the characters of But then you just took chicken and frog and jammed it together. Yeah, <laughs> some weren't as sophisticated as others. <laughs> I, I didn't plan for them to be as big. I mean, they were just a, you know, a story aspect because chicken was illegal. So, you know, these are scientists getting around it. But then Rob drew them so cute. And then they came back and, you know, it, like one story sort of begets another story idea. And so we introduced Chogs, but then uh, I introduced them later as like multicolored psychedelic Chogs. And, you know, because there's a psychedelic frogs that, you know, you can lick and, and you know, get a drug experience. So I just ripped that off. You know, you can now, you know, I had all these multicolored, really cute psychedelic chogs, and they kind of became our mascot. You know, we started putting them on shirts and, uh, you know, buttons, and then we made the little stuffed chogs, which were the greatest things ever. Like, I go to a show, and you don't even have to read Chew, and there'll be, like, a significant other who doesn't care about comics yep. but loves this little, you know, uh, stupid stuffed animal, and yep. will say, you know, hey, you dragged me to this con, yeah, buy me buy this me stuffed this. animal. <laughs> And they're also, I could pack like 40 in a suitcase, so they were, they were really good sellers. And uh, Chogs and, and Poyo were just kind of like a happy accident. Uh, and we're, we're working on a deal right now to make uh, Chog belts uh, with a, a guy who does like belt designs. Uh, so yeah, Chogs, uh, but yeah, like there's nothing sophisticated about <laughs> Chog and you know, Chicken and Frog. And then we were also calling them Frickin'. Like in the early issues, they're either Frickin' Frog chickens or chogs, chog frogs, but chog seems to that seemed to be the one that stuck a little better. Did you ever think of making candy? Well, yeah, you know, there was a lot of there was a lot of food stuff, yeah. and uh, well, no, because there's probably like some health stuff. But there was a point where we we got involved with this place called Skeleton Crew that made. Uh, uh, like swag, they, you know, they make the stuffed animals and the pins, right. and and you know, seeing your stuff made as toys, or you know, statues. There's nothing better. But um, early on, they wanted to do an apron because you know, chew's all about food, and you know, we can make a, a chew apron. And it's like, well, that's cool, but in real life, who uses an apron? And they're like, oh no, 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 it'll be awesome. And nobody does. I bought two or three of them for my girlfriend because she's like, these are awesome. They're hanging. Yeah. <laughs> so they made. You know, I didn't want to, but then it's like, well, they're taking the risk. You know, let them. Yeah. Uh, so they made chew aprons. Nobody bought them. Nobody cared. And then it came time to make a Poyo statue. And, and this was sort of at the height of chew. And they're like, well, we're going to make 500. And I'm like, mm, you should really make 1,000. And they got burned on the, uh, 
on the the aprons, so they they didn't think demand was there. So you know they do they only do a limited run, they do 500, sells out in a day. And it's like, oh, you idiots! You should have done a thousand. Uh, and so they did pollo, but it sold out so fast. Now they've done demon chicken pollo. So right. there's been two busts, and when that sells out in a couple of years. You know, we'll have demon chicken pollo, you know, in flames and stuff. So we'll have three pollo statues when it's all over. But, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really cool feeling having merchandise of, you know, your stuff. Did you – you didn't do action figures though, right? Well, th- we, we did mini mates at one point. Right. I do and, remember uh, seeing those. And that was just a weird thing. You know, I'm – you know, I have a lot of friends in the industry just from being – you know, just going to shows sure. and uh, and I, I I always hang up out with the Valiant guys. I don't really want to write for them because uh, I if I if I write superheroes, I want it to be you know Batman or Spider Man right. or whatever. Um, but the Valiant guys are super nice, and uh, I was always at a dinner with the Valiant publisher. We just we just got along, right. and uh, and he told me about their mini mate deal, and he's like, here's the name of the guy. So I just wrote him one time and like, hey, I do a book called Chew you know, mini mates are cool. How do we make this happen? And he's like, oh, we're doing a line of indie mates. And they did like Tim Seeley's book and uh, a couple others. And so they, they, they just did it. And, uh, you know, we didn't make a bunch uh, of money. You know, we don't make a ton of money, but we get a little check. And then there was a, you know, they, they phase them out every quarter. Right. But there was a, a three or six month period where you could walk into Toys R Us and see, you know, chew mini mates, and that Told was you hang in there. Yeah, you know that I could tell my mom go into Toys R Us, and she'd see something chew, and she thought you know that I hit it like really big time. Yeah, um, they're long gone now, and they're yeah. kind of like a collector's item. But you know that was that was cool too. Speaking of the image of uh, chew characters, as a writer and not an artist yourself, um, you obviously had the style visualized. Yeah. Like Yes and no. Some some of them I did like 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 the Savoy character was was kind of like um, uh, I, I I basically said he's late era Orson Welles, you know, and give him a monocle and and we played around. But but Rob had had really good design sense. And there's um, there's like an animator trick where uh, like a really well designed character you can tell just from the silhouette. And uh, like if you look at the two characters, you can really like. Rob's really good at like different like body types and stuff, and and more generic um, designers don't quite understand that. And I'm really lucky. My Outer Darkness guy is a really great designer, and so once I realize how good they are at design, I just kind of step back and let them do their thing. And uh, like I worked with this one Canadian. Uh, uh, and he only drew white people. Like everyone, uh, you know, I think he lives somewhere in like a frozen, you know, area where it's just, you know, white people in his small city. And I'd have to tell him, hey, dude, there, there's more than just white yeah. people out there. But Rob is like this mixed race dude from Louisiana. Yep. And he would draw, you know, uh, sort of a multitude of, of colors and ethnicities. Yep. And, and for me, it doesn't matter. You know, it's like I don't even care. If it's not germane to the story, I don't care if it's male or female. I don't care sure. if it's black and white. And Rob was really good about, you know, mix, mixing that up, which also helps for diversity of design. Of course, yeah. Um, was there anything that, that you kind of had an idea for, and then when he pumped out his version of it, you are like, yeah, that's way better? Uh, probably most of the time. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times I would just throw out, okay, think about this actor as a jumping off point. Like, like Caesar... Uh, who ends up with a crab claw by issue 48. Uh, but, you know, we based him on, uh, you know, Jules from uh, Pulp Fiction. Right. And, uh, you know, so, you know, it would be either be movie characters or, or actors or, or stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, uh, something I learned as an editor is um, if you got a good thing going with a, a, an artist is step back and let them have their freedom. Uh, I was an editor one time. And it was a newbie writer, but he was a control freak. And, and he'd be like, you know, he'd get a page and, and he'd just want to noodle everything. And he'd be like, well, you know, this character is very kind of left brain. You know, I, I see them as being, you know, you know left-handed because they're creative. And so, you know, can, can we change the character, put the watch on the other hand? And it's like, no. You, you got to ask yourself, is a reader going to notice or care? I mean, you can always try to make a comic book perfect. 
but if you're just asking the artist for a million corrections uh, to serve nothing except right. for you know if if uh, if it's for a story purpose, yes. But otherwise, just let it go. And I'm real good. There there was a couple things in Chew that Rob did that I didn't like, but then I realized eh, no one's gonna care. And a lot of times the issue would come out, and by then you know I couldn't even. I can point out two things in Chew that I I still don't like, uh, but it doesn't matter. You know, uh, there was a point where uh, where Olive, the daughter who's got Tony's power, she was pretending to be asleep and she's sucking her thumb. You know, just to to sort of reinforce. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, but I'm like, she gets visions from what she eats. She wouldn't suck her thumb. You know, that, and and Rob's just like, dude, you're overthinking it. And I'm like. Eh, I, I still think I'm right, but I'm not going to ask you to change it. You know, if you, you know, I'm not going to put more work on on your plate. Right. And right. Uh, and I mean, that's really something I think a lot of kind of newbie writers don't uh, sort of appreciate. Like, you have to keep your artist happy and um, y- uh, and and don't feel like you're constraining them you know give them freedom to draw whatever they want and uh like a lot of times when i'm working with an artist you know hey what do you like to draw you know what do you what do you want to draw and then you kind of uh you know work from there when i was doing batman uh jason fabak another canadian uh he was a nerd for batman and i learned very early on to make him happy he just wanted a toy every issue like okay let's get the bat plane in you know let's get the bat copter let's get the bat cave and if i could give him that he would be so happy, and a, a happy artist is an artist who gives you their best work. If it, if it helps, I remember the the panel where she's asleep and she has a thumb in her uh, mouth, and it didn't occur to me at all. Well, you know, the other thing <laughs> this, this is this is really weird. And I I uh, I didn't the, there the last this is a spoiler, so I won't go into too de- uh, deep. But the last page of Chew, I didn't really like, and it wasn't what I saw in my head, and but. It's exactly as I described it in the script. I just saw it from a different angle sure. and different. And Rob drew it, drew it more of a close up, and it was more intense. And this is the last page of your baby, and he didn't draw kind of what I wanted him to draw, but he drew what I asked him to draw. Draw, and it's also his baby, and yeah. he he followed the law. You know, he he did exactly what I said. He just did it in a, a different way. And so I had kind of had to step back, and it's like it's his book too. This isn't my favorite panel, but ultimately, it doesn't affect the story. No reader's going to notice. So, you know, I let it go. And that was a big one to let go. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, see that. But I don't, you know, I I don't regret it. You know, he, uh, so, you know, I think I'm a good collaborator. (laughs) Because uh, some some writers are a real pain in the ass with with artists, and I I try not to be. Did did you, oh, go ahead, go ahead. And my question is super simple, so. All right, so to elaborate on what you just said. Um, and enough of the spoilers. You already told us everybody freaking dies. Um, <laughs> well, that, that's not true, though. That's not true. Not Everyone doesn't die. A, a lot of people die. A I lot of people. hit you both. Um, <laughs> your thing. Um, you said that there were two things that you didn't like. That, those were the two things. Yeah. So then what was the vision that you wanted? For the last page? That last page, yes. Sorry. It, it, was a, 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 it was really a different angle. You know, I, I can't say it without literally spoiling the end of Chew. Okay. But, but you know, I saw it uh, just choreographed different, differently. Um, and, it, and I should have explained it better. Uh, so, yeah, it was just, you know, sometimes you see panels in your head different. And usually I, I'm, I'm really easy about letting it go. But this being the last page in a splash, that was kind of like, okay. And, and I talked about it with Rob, too. It's like, you know, this isn't what I saw. I'm not sure about it. And, you know, Rob and I had a relationship at the point where, Sometimes he would change stuff. Sometimes he'd say, you're overthinking it. Sometimes he'd say, I don't want to change it. And, you know, we never fought, but, you know, we would, we would have, you know, discussions yeah. about it. So it was a really, like, healthy uh, working relationship. And Rob and I could not be more different. Like, uh, at a show, he goes back to the room and, and you know, drinks milk and, <laughs> uh, and, you know, works all night. And I go out with my buddies until, you know, 4 a.m., you know, shutting down the bars. And, uh, um yeah, Rob and I were really different people. And sometimes you don't want a collaborator that's... Like, I was working with Nick Patera on uh, on Leviathan. And Nick is a goon and an idiot and a drunk. And so am I. <laughs> and uh, and 
I, I guess if you needed a, an adult in the relationship and we didn't have one. So yeah, Rob and I worked really well together. So my question, um, like you said, you make a lot of friends at cons and stuff like that, and I've done the same as a fan. Even you know, I'm, now I'm good friends with Jeremy Hahn and, and B. Clay Moore. Oh, they're, yeah, they're great. And, and one of the things that I always remember B. Clay Moore mentioned to me the one time because I bought a page of his from Ramon Perez, and uh, it was Clay had written it, Ramon had drawn it, and I, I was like, "Look what I picked up from one of your books," and his response was. That's awesome. I don't think I own a page of art from anything I've ever written. Oh, weird. And weird. being a guy, like we were talking about your George Perez piece, do you have original art from, from Chu or, oh, or yeah, stuff yeah. you've written? So, well, first of all, as an editor, you tend to get original art. Like, yeah. you know, uh, uh, artists are – and I worked – like, things have changed. I'm, I'm an old man, and in you know, back in my day, uh, they would have to send – uh, art and you would have to scan it in right. and then you would have to print it to you know four color you know CMYK film and then you'd have to send the film to FedEx you know to to the Canadian printers now they just scan it themselves yeah. or they do it digitally and it's all PDFs and you just upload it to the printer and uh, so you don't see the art but a lot of times you'd get you know an issue of planetary from John Cassidy yep. and you know towards the end of the run he's like yeah take a page and so just from an editor uh, I got like you know Brian Hitch page a Frank Quietly page like yeah. editors are spoiled, but um, uh, when Chu came along, you know Rob and I did this kind of informal contract you know in case one of us screwed each other over and we're all sure. we're all pretty moral. But written into this is I said uh, you know I want a page of every arc, and, and at first I thought we were just going to do one arc, so I thought it would be you know one page, and then we ended up doing doing 12 yeah and i would even buy a couple pages if i uh and if he had a buyer on the line like if he had someone willing to pay him two thousand dollars for a page i'm not going to take money out of his pocket right. but um i've got every single bed page nice <laughs> uh and i'll i'll show you there's a there's a lot of kind of repeated repeating jokes in chew and uh there there's people who kind of like wind up in bed together and so there's these splashes of you know characters in bed and there's probably one every arc and it sometimes when there's two you know i get one for free and then buy the other right but i have every nice. single bed page um i have a cover and he would have given me more but again you don't want to take money out money of out their pocket, pocket. Yeah. and then there was one point where um i bought a double page spread just because i didn't have any and i, I you know he, he gives you a good deal but you sure. also you know don't want to undercut him but yeah i've got a pretty good art collection i used to uh I used to collect Cerebus, so I still have those pages. And uh, my very favorite comic on Earth is Stray Bullets. Okay. And uh, uh, David Lapham never used to sell his art, ever. Uh, but he's got like five kids, and they're all approaching college age, and suddenly he's selling art. And so I, I and a few other people who love Stray Bullets have just been swooping in and just buying page nice. after page. And oh, God, I love Stray Bullets. Are we... Yeah, we are hitting oh. that time limit. <laughs> uh, anyone got a final question? I mean, thanks for coming in. Um, yeah. Sure. Kind of real quick, but I don't think we can answer this real quick. But like, how, um, how detailed would you say your, your scripts are? My scripts are very detailed. Like, they're way more detailed. They're not Alan Moore level, yeah. but if you read, like, a Bendis or a Jason Aaron, like, I tend to talk to my artists, and I tend to, like, if I have an editor, like, I always make fun of the editor, and I, like put little asides in and it's it's really just a conversation between you and the creative team and you could actually google the chew number one uh uh script is online so google chew number one cover and i think uh comic book resources has it so you write it kind of like um i don't know there's like this open letter style of, of comic book scripts where it's you're almost like writing a letter to the artist a little bit but but i'm also you know uh uh, you know, I'll say, you know, four four panel page, you know, with two panels on the on the upper tier, and then you know a final panel that's you know a third of the page for emphasis. And uh, but I always put in a note at the beginning if I'm working a new artist. Look, I'm going to lay things out very specifically. You've got veto power because it's ultimately, you know, you you it's it's your vision you're putting on a page. So I'm going to lay out what I see. But if you can do it better, you know, do it. So, you know, I, I, I get very specific, but they know they've got the freedom to do whatever they want. So not the John Wagner way. 
John McRae was talking, Wagner's script would say, dread on bike. Oh, yeah, not <laughs> at all, not at all. But I, but I also tend to, uh, like, write my fight scenes really loose. Like, okay, this guy has the upper hand. You know, it's a three- or four-panel fight scene. Add more panels if you want. But, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, you know, he, 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 punching, kicking, I don't care. You yeah. know, choreograph fights Just your own way. And, and artists seem to like that. So thanks, you guys. I'm sitting down for one more hour, and then I'm catching a plane. Uh, oh, anybody want a signed copy of Chew?